Hello everyone. Today I have something special for you and a new series that I will be doing, just interviews with artists. And today I have a new friend named Dorian Eiten who reached out to me and we instantly became friends and chatted for a long time and decided we would make an interview that we could share on YouTube. So we recorded this this morning and just had a great chat and wanted to share it with all of you. So without further ado, here we go. There's certain people that I meet online that I know are just kindred spirits, people who have that same passion. And Dorian yes. is absolutely one of them, for sure. I found something out that you don't know yet. Oh, what's that? Can I tell the story of how we connected? Sure, yeah. So I run two Discord servers for artists. And one of my students posted your video on the the power in the grays on color relativity. Yep. And I watched it and I thought, yes, like, this guy is speaking my language, like such good information. <laughs> and I can feel your passion for teaching and for light and art. So that a couple days after that, I kept watching videos on your channel and just feeling like, yeah, this is really great. And then you mentioned that you're starting to do more mentoring and you left your email address in your video description. And I just felt like right. reaching out and I did. <laughs> and we had a great two hour <laughs> yeah. call and I had prepared for that and found out that actually I knew you, I knew your work from way back. You made a DVD <laughs> called Practical Light and Color 16 years ago. Yeah. And I watched a it a long back time then. ago. And so oh, wow. to prepare for today, I, I opened that DVD again. I still have it. And I started watching and it yep. blew my mind because I realized you are <laughs> one of my main influences for teaching, like how I do it and what I do. Oh, really? And I found some things really? that I stole from you, <laughs> like explanations, illustrations <laughs> that are really good. And I just, I changed them a bit, but I recreated them to the, yeah. do something similar to oh, what you did. Great. So you and Scott Robertson, I think are Oh, wow. Two of my main influences. So it's really, I didn't know that when oh, I reached wow. out to you. It's so fun. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to the conversation. Uh, it was funny so many years ago that I did that. And I, I think I did it because, um, I mean, I reached out to the Nomen Workshop. Usually they reach out to people and say, hey, will you teach a class? But I reached out to them. I wasn't known in the industry. Nobody knew me. I, I just yeah. said to them that, like, I have these ideas that I don't see being taught anywhere anywhere you know not in what was that 2005 2006 something like that you know it was a long long time ago and uh so they were like sure you know you can make a video for us and then just put together those things and it's amazing how much that through time um I, I don't care who teaches it just get that knowledge out there it's just the basics of art that i think is sort of lost in our culture in our digital age um, yeah i want to thank you for doing that work and putting it out there had a big impact on me. What's really fun is that now we can take even more years experience and share even more because I've learned so much more over the past 16 years and little things that, you know, would refine that talk. And I've given that talk so many different times and then I've expanded it and learned more and I've worked in more industry sense. And, you know, your background and my background, we have similarities and we have differences, you know, but where we learn, you know, the things that you learned when you studied in, in Florence, was it right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that's one of the things I thought would be fun to talk about is just kind of like the similarities and differences in our careers and where we've gone and what we've learned and how we learn from that and, you know, where we're going. So I don't know if you want to give a, a bit of a background of, of your history. It'd be great. Yeah, I'd love to. I prepared some slides of like my journey. If you want, we can yeah. go through that. Like that 20 great. years in 10 minutes. That's me at like five, six years old in Switzerland. And I was drawing, you know, like That's every fine. kid draws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 1990. And I was super shy. And I think drawing for me was a way to connect with people especially later on, like yeah. in high school, primary school, high, yeah, high school more or so. And I got into hip hop culture, break dancing, 
graffiti. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not very good, but you know, I love that creative way of living. And then Photoshop came out. And well, it started oh, with yep. MS Paint, you know, just painting pixels, but then Photoshop came yep. out. <laughs> and I just pressed every single button in that program, like tried all the filters just to see what they do. <laughs> I was playing Counter-Strike and we had a clan, so I made graphics. And at some point I was asked to design uh, concert posters as part of a youth center. We organized different concerts in different yeah. styles, like different genres of music. And I was the guy to design the posters. And it was really fun to see my work up in the city, I, I would be part of the, the group that, that puts up the posters on the walls of the supermarket and so forth and stand in the, in the street and hand out flyers. So that was my first you know, commissions work to professional artist. Yeah. <laughs> At maybe 15, 16. And then January, like the new year of 2000. Or I decided to draw every single day, like for as long as I can, like to really take it seriously. I numbered the drawings. So this is number one. Uh, somewhere is number two. This is three up there. Yeah. Uh, I read Andrew Loomis's book and copied from there. Fun with a pencil and drawing the head and hands. This is my mom. Like at the end of the first month. 25th of January. And I struggled a lot, especially perspective. Did not come easily. <laughs> yeah, I see all... your, your text over there on the right. <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> Just not getting it. But I keep keep trying. And then every couple of months I would make a drawing that was way better than what I think I could do. The, yeah. the drawing on the left is mine and on the right is from Gottfried Bommes, anatomy teacher, German teacher. And I looked at the finished drawing and I was like, what, how did this come out of me? I didn't know I can do this. <laughs> and that kept me motivated the next six months of like stagnation <laughs> and not feeling like I'm getting anywhere. And this was a time when I was graduating from high school and looking at what what path to take i was interested in computers i was building my own websites from like age 14 and tried to start a company with a friend of mine to build websites for people which didn't go anywhere but you know, that's <laughs> trying to, to to make things happen and i was looking for yeah educational avenues and i thought it would either be going to be something with computers and media or drawing art and the art school in switzerland is like most public art schools or universities they don't have the emphasis on the craft it's more the conceptual yeah. ideas behind the work so i took evening classes in both zurich and lucerne but i did not get instructions like well here's the model just go ahead and draw well, but, but how <laughs> anatomy but, perspective? Yes. How do you do this? There was none of that. Yes. But I found this image online and it just stopped me in my tracks. Like, what is this? There's a painting here and there's a sculpture here. This is Matthew That's Grubelski. Amazing. And the picture I found out was take, was taken at Angel Academy of Art. And so I went to Florence. I also went to Paris, like I was really looking for the best school I can find. In Florence at that time, there were three schools and I visited all of them and felt most comfortable like socially at Angel Academy. And I also liked the work the most because it's the, it was the most kind of refined. This was the studio back then. So very traditional classic atelier style education. People draw from sculptures. Half the day it's like drawing from sculptures and the other half of the day is drawing from the model. And you go like that three years, four years. First wow. starting with charcoal and then switching to oil paint. And when I was there, I felt like 
yes, I found my school, I found my place. Um, it was a bit of a struggle financially. I, our family could not afford to send me there, but I got a scholarship. I managed, despite like regulations in Switzerland that they can't support students studying abroad and they can only support students who are enrolling in a program that gives them a degree, like a bachelor or master. I had none of the two. Yeah. That was a third thing also, third requirement, but I just convinced them <laughs> to give me a chance anyway, because in art, it's not about the degree, it's about the skill. Absolutely. And I could not learn this in Switzerland anymore. So I actually got a statement from one of the uh, rector, I don't know what that's what it is in English, rector yep. of the art school in Lucerne. He wrote a letter for me confirming that actually, yes, this type of craft and drawing is not taught anymore in Switzerland. Yeah, with my wow. enthusiasm and arguments, I got financial help <laughs> and was able to go to Florence. These are from the first few weeks, we're copying drawings in pencil. On the left is the original, and on the right is my pencil yep. drawing. And you train your eye, like you train to see. So you're not drawing what you think is there, like how an eye, how you think an eye looks, but actually what the shapes are doing shapes, values, and edges. That's all this is. You can turn it upside down. Maybe it even helps because it's just, you're looking at it as abstract shapes. And there's a couple techniques and like mental uh, methods for seeing truthfully what's there. And <laughs> with these projects, there's no time limit. So these are the morning projects copying drawings and copying sculptures. It just takes as long as it takes until the teacher says, okay, this is good enough. Now you can go on to the next project. Not when you're like, okay, I, I think it's good enough. Let me go on. No, nope. <laughs> <They tell you, laughs> <when you're> <laughs> until they say, yeah, yeah. And this one took three months of drawing three, four hours every day. Wow. This one, these seven, are charcoal, two and a half months. Yeah, this is charcoal. You can see here. There's a sculpture yeah. and then there are two students left and right. Here I was on the left. And the process is very systematic. Like you go from the blank page and go through like six, seven steps. They're the same steps in every drawing. It's very methodical, reliable. You're learning a craft. This is not about expressing yeah. yourself or ideas. It's learning to use the instrument. This was charcoal and chalk on toned paper. So the base here, that's the, the tonal value of the paper. And anything that's lighter is white chalk, you see here. And anything that's darker yeah. is charcoal. This is beautiful. Thank you. I love doing this stuff. And there are, you're not cap copying mindlessly like a camera. You're making tons of decisions of what to emphasize, depth of field here, getting everything yeah. lower contrast and softer edges. I find whenever I'm doing studies that it to me is like it's like meditation. You know, yes. like it's very it's yeah. very calming. You know, it, it's just such Absolutely. a beautiful thing. I get into that state where I just you're making lots of choices and you're stretching yourself creatively, but it's it's calming at the same time. Yeah. And then you finish your meditation session. And if you meditate just on a cushion, that's it. But if you meditate with a canvas in front of you, you finish the session and you get an artifact that's a physical painting or drawing. Yes. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so amazing. So this one is from life, from a model. And with these, there is a time limit. So I yeah, think for the model's sake. Four weeks. Yeah. But yeah, some people are shocked. Like these models stand in the same pose for four weeks three hours a day. I did that once with a friend and we each had iPads and we were like, uh -huh. okay, I want to paint you just a portrait of your face. And I had to sit still for 45 minutes. And that was hard. Yes, don't you move your face. Don't blink. Don't look more. anywhere else. I'm like, wow, if I, that was hard at 45 minutes. I can't imagine yeah. three hours of standing multiple times in the same pose. Wow. Yeah. It's hard work. 
We do 25 minutes in pose and then five minutes break, 25, yeah. five, and then there's a 20 minute break in the middle. Wow. And there will be students like in a half circle around the model. So different perspectives. Yeah. And then same, but in oil. Same time limits with the oil? Yeah, as with four charcoal? weeks, sometimes five weeks. Yeah. And everyone, in the beginning, the first third, people are kind of relaxed still. But the last week, everyone is like, fuck, 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 rushing to <laughs> get the hands, ah. get the feet, the things we've ignored, you know? Right, yeah. Never enough time. <laughs> And of course, you get faster with practice. These are all student Basically. works. And it's amazing how like lay people, like people who don't draw and paint, when they look at a the painting, they see content. They see, oh, pomegranate, oh, flowers. But me, when I was painting this, it was all abstract. My considerations, what was in my mind was all hierarchy of of saturation like having the highest saturation in the foreground less saturation less saturation to get, create space and depth value contrast the same thing the brightest thing in the foreground yeah. middle darkest pattern repetition so this dotty round thing that's in the fabric it's also in the pomegranate it's also in the vase it's also in the back it's also in the flowers that in terms of shape ties everything together I was thinking completely abstract, but working yeah. with, with uh, concrete like, objects. Isn't that the thing that like when we say see like an artist, this is yeah. those are the things where you start seeing the world differently because you're not paying attention to something that you say that is a yellow pot and a red fruit anymore. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, it depends on the light and the light can change and that can be any color and that the texture in it, you know, like seeing it from a different perspective, like you said, the way the patterns and the way the contrast and the way the light is, it, it's a whole different way of thinking. And once you start thinking that way, it changes the way you do your art and suddenly your art can really advance because you're seeing differently. Yeah. I always wondered when I was younger, you know, when I was thinking about painters and wondering, do they see the world differently? Or musicians, do they hear the world differently? And absolutely. And it, for me, it's one of the biggest gifts yeah. of this education, that there are so many things every day that I notice, beautiful light effects. If I'm in the bus, how the light plays on the hair of the person in front of me, or talking to someone. And the more I know, the more I see, and it's really enriching my yeah. life experience. If you look at my photo album on my phone, it would probably look very bizarre to people. Uh -huh. because I'm just out and I'm on a walk somewhere and I pull out my phone to take a picture. I'm like, it's of this garbage can, you yeah. know, but it's like, but it's reflecting the light in just the most beautiful way. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Such of odd pictures of anything. And then there's those times. Yeah. You see someone on a bus and you're like, I don't, I can't really take a picture of just strangers. <laughs> yeah. But you can sketch it or just memorize it, like really observe it. Take it in. Right. So I graduated from Angel Academy in 2009 and had always been interested in games and animation. I have the most powerful moving experience with a piece of art, I'll call it that, that I've ever had was seeing Princess Mononoke, Mononoke Hime, mm -hmm. from Mayao Miyazaki. Like that movie shook me. It's like, wow, I want to do something like that. Um, and yeah, interested in games. So throughout my time in Florence, I had taught myself ZBrush and just kept going with Photoshop and Painter and just like trying everything. Art Rage. I don't know if that's still around. <laughs> 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 trying all kinds of digital tools as well. And I found out about this new school that was starting called the art department. And I reached out to them about taking classes and they actually asked me to come teach with them to share what I learned in Florence oh, wow. at one of their studios. And I ended up running the studio in San Francisco that was dedicated to the academic traditional art. They had four studios, but also online classes. 
and that was amazing like working with different teachers from film from games we worked with pixar as our animation department so pixar artists were teaching our students and yeah just people from from these companies working with us and i was a student at the same time as i was teaching which was stressful and intense, Interesting. but also super fun. <laughs> yes. Uh, so these are some of my assignments for the entertainment design program that I then took. Yeah. I was learning the basics. And I did not work on Ghost in the Shell. This was a project to match the design <laughs> language. Inspired by. Yeah. Like take a design. Yeah. Uh, and like study the design language of an IP and make something for that world, which is a necessary skill if you're working in that capacity. Um, before I go to, to mentors about the teaching, I was actually pulled into teaching against my will initially. <laughs> when I moved to Florence, I rented a room with an Italian lady and her boyfriend was kind of a rough character. Grew up in an orphanage, stealing cars as a teenager, working in construction. Oh, wow. Like, a gritty person, but also a huge heart. And he had turned his life around and started meditating. And he was very interested in history, the Etruscans, it's the history of Italy and culture. And when he saw what I was doing at the academy, like these, these cast drawings, he said, I want to learn from you. I'm going to make a school and you can come teach at my house. Okay. And I thought he's just, <laughs> he's just talking, you know, but two months later, three months later, he came up, came to me and said, Hey, it's ready. Like I converted my, I painted my living room. I have three easels and actually have two other students. So when do we start? And I freaked out. Wow. I was very shy, <laughs> like my whole childhood, very withdrawn, you know, antisocial, anxious. And I did not speak Italian, like barely. And the students only spoke Italian. And oh, wow. I had never taught at that point. I was still a student. It was in my second year, I think, at the academy. So I was like, no, everything inside of me was like, I can't. But at that point, I couldn't <laughs> turn him down, you know? So I went and I'd always been taking notes for myself of what I was learning. I like structuring information. So I, I was prepared and we had the first session and I really, really enjoyed it. When I saw my students taking the tools that I gave them, the concept and practicing and having aha moments and improving, like that's so awesome. So thank you, Emanuele, <laughs> for, for pulling me <laughs> into teaching. Because I think without that, I also would not have had the, the confidence or even seen the opportunity, possibility of me teaching at the art department. Yeah, and I've been teaching ever since. And it's been the main focus actually the last 15 years or so. Um, before this art department adventure started, my plan after the academy was to work with a mentor, like with someone who runs a studio, because there's a lot of things we didn't learn right. at the academy, like how to run your painting business, how to interface with galleries, collectors, had to work with models, all these things. And there are not many people left who take on apprentices like that. And yeah. If neither of these three people were like formal apprenticeships, maybe Christopher Pugliese the most. Um, but I spent time with each of these people and learned a lot. So Chris is in New York, Hoboken. I think he moved now, I'm not sure where he's, he is now. He paints these huge multi-figure compositions. Wow. And here, my job was to do the first layer, like the first pass of these bodies on the canvas. 
for, like looking at his study because he was still finishing the study. Yep. I was just giving one layer of paint and then he at the end of the day would go over and correct my mistakes and just pull everything together. That was really liberating for me because I felt like whatever I do, I can't mess it up so bad that he cannot fix it because he's really <laughs> good at what he does. And for him, it was a, like a super productivity boost to, to get his paintings moving forward much faster. Doing a painting of that scale, that's huge. Yeah. yeah. This is the same size as the one before, maybe a little bit smaller. Wow. And, you know, having fun also working with other people in the studio. I, I'm used to doing everything by myself also because I was not very good socially. And that is changing, luckily. And maybe we can talk about that a bit more later. Ted Jacobs is a, many people called him the last or one of the last old masters. And he taught many people who now have their own schools. And when I got there to France, where he lives or lived, he was 85 or 86, but still teaching, wow. you know, living in the middle of nowhere in France. And he's one of the people who get the closest to like a holographic illusion of real objects being right in front of you, but it's a painting. And this is also something wow. fascinating to me. If you took a picture of these objects, like a photograph and developed, printed the photograph and stuck it next to the painting, the photograph would be so flat in comparison to the painting <laughs> because of the physical pigment the thickness of the paint and the decisions of the artist. It doesn't come through here on the screen, but there it's like magic, his work. And, I remember uh, doing painting with some friends, uh, just to interject an idea sure. here too. And we would be painting a still life and we did it every week. And I would see one particular artist who their work was just so much better than reality. I'm like, mm -hmm. what did you do? And like, I'm learning to just, just see, and then they would take it and like enhance it where it was better than what you could actually see. And that's one of those skills that's even harder to get. And like, you've done this enough that you can say, you know, it'd be better for a little more contrast here and a little different saturation here and like knowing where to push and pull. It's just amazing. Yeah. And that is a skill it comes with experience. Yeah. And it gets more and more fun. I think them because you have more and more freedom to tweak things. Ted also painted his whole house, like all the walls in wow. his home were painted, even the floor here. It's a goldfish pond. You can't really see it in the picture, maybe here a little bit. You're walking wow. over water as you're coming into his house. And Patrick, he's a Swiss artist who lived in the US for 26 years, I think and has returned to Switzerland. And we went, uh, I, I found his work online and contacted him and we went for a hike. And that day, like on that hike, it was the second time that we met, but the first time was like an hour or two. And on that day, we decided like, we have so many things in common, so many interests in common, like we need to do stuff together. So I decided to move in with him. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> like, this That's is incredible, fun. incredible match. Like, let's, yeah, let's go forward together. He's a sculptor as well as a painter and works on imagination a lot, but also from life. And he can do this thing of uh, like understanding how things look enough to, to invent my like, dream. He actually paints his dreams. He has very vivid dreams that are lit like Rembrandt or Vermeer paintings. And that's what he paints. Wow. Also like complex multi-figure composition with a lot of depth. It's like this. He made the sculpture that's here, but it was much smaller. This is his daughter. It was about 9-11, this painting. A beautiful human. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, yeah. It, we, you had sent um, the link to some of his work and I watched some of the videos too. And just, 
it seems like it's not only about the the painting and the skill and the craft it's about the story and the emotion behind you know this is a social commentary on his thoughts of the world visually yeah. and it's just so fascinating yeah he's a deeply empathic person and he suffers because of that like watching the news and stuff that's happening really affects him but yeah beautiful person and for those watching like look up his website there's a short documentary that gives a good impression of his work and his I'll, I'll put the link to his website yeah any of the the sites or different people that you mentioned i'll put in the uh, description mm -hmm. so that people can click on it cool yeah yeah just amazing stuff then well the art department kind of imploded unfortunately um but i think for two or three years i i was teaching and studying there and then i got a job offer from barcelona academy of art and they had their very traditional academy with a bit of more contemporary awareness for art and they had a digital art department and they brought me on to help out teaching and then the former director moved on to work at ubisoft i think and left me with the program so then I was in charge <laughs> of like building the digital art and design department, we called it. Um, like within the context of a classical academy. So we did cast drawings, but we did it on in Photoshop or Clip Studio uh, or on the iPad. We did figure drawing, yeah. but we also made so this is a digital digital cast painting done in Photoshop. Just same thing, like learning to see, refining yourself as an instrument. Photoshop as well. And we did some sculpting in 3D. I think I have this guy here. Oh, really? So one oh, of my students amazing. made it, but he didn't want it. So <laughs> I have it now. <laughs> <laughs> we made a a book, several little books. So we did like class projects. So students get a bit of experience of what it means to actually make a project happen, not just abstract assignments. This was a book about little creatures that live in the academy. And this guy collects charcoal sticks. Examples, every student created a <laughs> character design and made an <laughs> illustration. Oh, I love these. <laughs> yeah, it was fun, hard work. I got some, <laughs> uh, with this project, especially I got the worst, um, student feedback at the end of the term, like people were really <laughs> exhausted. We worked hard. We made a game with uh, blender and unity engine. Um, <laughs> but so like students expressed kind of frustration and like it was too intense, but we also had at the same time, the highest retention rate. Usually some people would drop off, you know, not continue, but this term, everyone continued. So I thought that was interesting. <laughs> There's was... so much to learn. And if you're doing like just painting and then digital painting and then creating games and 3D modeling and everything, that's a lot of information to learn. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what it is like to work in the industry, I think, in games and film. It's intense, it's complex. It's funny, as you talk about some of the early paintings and drawings that you did, the charcoal drawings, and like this one took a month, you know, working every day for mm -hmm. a few hours a day or two. And like, yeah, the, I come from the film industry where like, yeah, you get an hour, you know, for <laughs> that, you know, maybe two hours and, yeah. and that's it. And you have to be done, you know? And so learning to go crazy fast, it's a very different type of world. And yet yeah. the art is still the same being able to see is still key. Yeah. I think as an artist, as a student, it's useful to practice both of these things. If you only do fast things, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, if an hour is the longest you've ever worked on a painting, I challenge slash invite you to spend five hours like make a still life painting and spend five hours and see how far you can get. 
because you learn other things yeah. as you spend that amount of time. And for someone who only does very slow work, it's also good to challenge yourself and have a time limit and organize your work flow exactly. to do it within that time. Um, we would do figure drawing and figure painting at, at Pixar. And there was, you know, doing a 30 second pose is yeah. really hard, but then doing a two hour long pose, you know, it was a whole different thing, but it's still yes. a same a model. And so you're like learning two different sides of it. Yeah. The more different experiences you have, the more you can bring it all together. Right. Something I skipped here because it's already a lot of images is that I had also some time at the Russian Academy of Art in Florence, which works very differently, completely differently from Angel Academy. Angel was more focused on perception, like visually seeing what's there. And the Russians work more like they did in the Renaissance, more drawing what you know, like sculpting the form, creating. Yeah, sculpting the form is the best I can describe it. So there are two different approaches to drawing, but they're complementary. And I think if you have both, you have more freedom and you have more, more tools to make the, the image you want and to say what you want to say. Because in the end, art is communication. Yeah. I think that's really key is knowing that there's not one way to do yeah. it. There's not just one way to learn, not just one way to create. And you just have to do as much as you can and absorb as much as you can and put it into your storytelling. Yeah. And find what you love most, what you enjoy most. Yeah. So this was still in Barcelona. And then as we all know, COVID came and the school closed down <laughs> and I was extremely fortunate because I had a crisis just before COVID. We didn't, I didn't know COVID was going to come, like lockdowns were going to come. But about a month before I was at a point where I couldn't pay my rent for the first time in my life. And I knew I had to do something. I didn't want to borrow money or like go to my parents or anything like that. And I had been working on an online course, but it was not ready. I wasn't happy with it. And it was only four modules of eight modules were done. But in that situation, I decided this is the, the smartest thing I can do. Just publish the course, even if it's unfinished. And I became self-employed to do that. So all the tax stuff would be taken care of. And I finished that whole paperwork process. The last thing was to go to the bank and pick up my credit card. I got home and two days later, the lockdown happened. So I was set up wow. perfectly to start with my online course and my new company. And I couldn't go to work in the school anymore and everyone was at home. So I was really, really lucky with the timing there. And that course is the shading course where I'm combining like, everything I've learned basically and, and teach it and draw with students teaching how light works, how to invent light and shadow. There's stuff from you in there. There's stuff from Scott Robertson in there, <laughs> Angel Academy. And it's super fun. We do weekly feedback sessions where we meet each other and give feedback on the work. And it's an alive thing. Like I'm adding lessons and demonstrations regularly to make the course more complete. And it's my main occupation, this, this course and the community around it. Yep. That's it for story and background. Wow. Thanks for indulging me. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's really fascinating. I think you went deeper with this than when we talked, um, a yeah. week or two ago. And I, I love seeing that the story that each, every artist that I meet has their own unique story of how they got to where they're at, where they've worked and where they've learned from and where their sources of inspiration are from. And uh, it's always fascinating, the human element to this, like, where have you learned? So thank you for sharing. That's, that's amazing. And so I am now at a similar point that you were a few years ago. And like, I have decided to go full-time into mentoring and teaching um, just after 
25 years in the industry, I think it's time to to try something new and to be my own boss now for a while and and see what this is like and see if I can help people in their art and spend more time creating than, you know, like it. I think for me, I worked in the industry to the point where I was the majority of my time was looking at budgets and spreadsheets. And it's like, this is not what I want to do as a, (laughs) as a lead artist. I want to be doing the art and the craft, but I had gotten promoted beyond the level where I was doing the art and like, I'm not interested in being a producer or being the one who looks at all the budgets anymore. I want to, I want to get back to the craft and that's really where my love is and with, with people as well. Congratulations on making the jump. Yeah, thanks. It's definitely uh, scary and it's it's taking a lot of work to, again, how do you take all of these ideas and make it where it's a systematic, you know, class that somebody can practically do and it's not overwhelming. I, I think that yeah. it's interesting finding those places where people get stuck. And this, I would love to ask you about this in your career, especially with teaching. What are the things that you find that students and people where they get stuck and they start spinning in circles and they don't go anywhere with their art and like how to get out of that. I have my, my ideas of that, but I would be interested in hearing your thoughts. Yeah. So many things. And I'm really interested in the psychological aspect of, of making art. I think the, if you're, you're limited in technical skill, you could just go out and get, like develop the skill through practice. But a lot of people are stuck with internal struggles, like lack of confidence or, or being just so afraid of, of sharing their work that even if like, and I've done this myself, I've taken an online course with an amazing teacher, but I was so unhappy with my work and so like identified with my work that I did the homework, but I didn't post it. So of course I didn't get any feedback which is not the smartest way to go about it, but it was the best thing I could do at the time. It's like one thing is separating yourself from your work. You may have put a lot of effort into the piece that you're showing, but just like I am not this pencil, like I'm here, the pencil is here. I'm also not the painting. If I realize that, then I can post it and the feedback almost always is useful or well-intentioned. And if it's not, I need to like have the, the boundaries to not feel attacked if someone is criticizing my work. And that's something too, if people want to be in the art industry, is mm-hmm. that's, that's one of the skills that you're going to need above everything else is the ability to watch somebody take your work and rip it to pieces <laughs> and critique it and to be okay with going, this is, yeah. this is just part of the process because we're trying to find there's one person's story and my story. And maybe, you know, it, it feels very personal, well, you know, personal, it feels very vulnerable to put your art out there because you are, yeah. uh, you are identity it's really hard not to find our identity in our jobs because we spend the majority of our day doing this. Yeah. Like, I am an artist and that piece is an example of my work. So if somebody comes and says, your composition is all wrong and your values are wrong and it's just unclear, we take it very personally. Hmm. But what if, what if they're right? And that was the best you could do with the this, you know, the knowledge that you had at that point, and you can learn from this, that next time it's even closer to being able to communicate a story with somebody, then it's exciting to get feedback, but boy, that's a hard lesson to learn. I agree with you. Yeah. I think that comfort of confidence and comfort, I don't know, of being in a relationship with yourself, that even if someone tears your work apart, you're cool with yourself. Like it doesn't, it's not threatening that for most people that takes work. And one way to practice that is courage, a courageous action. I can, there's so many situations and problems in my life. I've, I've experimented with this perspective. I asked myself, what if the solution is considerate, compa- uh, considerate, courageous action? or just courageous action? What if the solution is courageous action here? 
very often there's something I know I should do, but I'm scared. And I've observed in like in my experience when I do that thing that I feel like that's the thing I should do, but I'm scared, but I'm going to do it anyway. When I do it, when I'm courageous, something good happens. I don't know. I have this kind of deal with, with life, with the universe. And so far it's worked every time. And if I don't do it, something not so cool is going to happen or nothing happens. And I'm like, just not progressing. So I've, and maybe I'm tricking myself with this, but it works well. And I think courage is something good to develop. It's also like showing my work. If I don't feel good about it, it might be a courageous act, but then I get feedback back and benefit from it. I think that that's something that is in all of us as artists too. I mean, the, the imposter syndrome, that feeling mm. that I'm not good enough. And I don't know a single artist who doesn't struggle with this, you know, even ones who are, you know, they're directors of films and they're always like, Hmm, is this the right choice? Ah, am I yeah. good enough for this? You know, all of, when you get to know the people, I'm like, this is really common. This is not, um, this is not something that only junior artists deal with. This is something that is human you know, and, in learning how to be vulnerable and to be okay with it, to accept ourselves wholly, yeah. just go, this is who I am. And this is my experiences. My son often says that, you know, he wants to live. He has no regrets because every mistake in life has led him to be who he is now. And he's just not going to have regrets in life. And mm -hmm. I was not raised in the same ideology as a child. So for me, it was like, oh no, I had a lot of regrets and things that I did. But like, if I think about it, every mistake that I've made has formed me into who I am now. And so being able to accept myself and just say, oh, it's, I'm okay with me, with, you know, with the, the nice parts of me and the hard parts of me, you know, and success in life. This is not even just about art anymore. This is a yeah. very deeply philosophical thing. And like just accepting yourself for who you are is yeah. a hard skill. Yeah. I feel like it's even harder now with the age of the internet, because now you're not just comparing to the 10 people in your art class in school. You are now comparing to the entire planet and you see other people who have, you know, all of this experience and you're like, I have to be instantly at this level. And, you know, I, I don't think that a lot of people get to see the amount of work and the amount of hours in that time. Like you said, just taking 10 hours, 15 hours on a single painting and the time of really observing, do I do this shade or that shade? And what is actually happening in here and hand doing each individual little bit of a texture? I don't yeah. think that a lot of people will see that. They'll just, they'll see a final painting and be like, wow, you must've done that in 45 minutes and I can't do it. So I'm a failure. Yeah. yeah. Which is why it's important to have conversations like this, I think. Yeah. I was gonna I was gonna transition to another question that we had talked about. And I know you've done a lot of traveling. And traveling is something that is very dear to me. Um, I've traveled a lot, you know, in my life. I've been very fortunate to to visit all kinds of different countries around the world. And I think that that has helped my art. Uh, and it's helped me too, because I was a very quiet child. You know, I remember someone coming to me when I was in elementary school and you know, I was in like fifth grade, and they're like, Are you new? And I'm like, no, I've been mm. with you the entire time. And they're like, they didn't know I was in the class and I had been there for them, wow. you know, with them for five or six years. So I was wow. a very quiet <laughs> child. And as an, as an adult, I've learned to come out and be yeah. more social and to travel. And I think travel has really affected me and my art because I've been able to see other perspectives. Like you said, you were in mm -hmm. Italy and you're teaching an art class to people who, you know, you don't speak Italian and that's all they speak that does something to you. It, it gives you, you know, it challenges you. So I want to, you know, ask you about your travels and how that's inspired your art, how that inspires your art now, because you still do traveling quite a bit, right? Yeah, it was funny. I did more traveling during 2020, 21, like the COVID lockdown time than I had done the years before. And <laughs> it was fine. And it was, that's the airports were empty. The, the tourist spots were all really calm. It was great. That's um, actually quite nice. I think travel equals learning. 
or growth, especially if you're going to a place where you're not familiar with the language or even the alphabet. Like I just spent two yes. months in Japan <laughs> and I, yeah, it's a very different culture. Um, I don't know exactly how, how it influences me or inspires me, but I'm sure it opens my perspective. Um, gives me more possibilities and less fear. I think that's a big one too. We are afraid of the unknown. Like I was scared yeah. of going to Russia when I went three, three years ago, more or less. Like, yeah, I had heard like scary things in the media. I'm scared of China too, but the Russians, the everyday Russians are lovely people like the everyday Chinese probably are too. And so having been there, like I have a very different attitude and much, much less fear about these places. I think my perspective, having lived many different places too, I've moved too many times in my life, you know, moved 22 times. And Jesus. <laughs> what I learned, yeah, I know it's way too many. And nine of those were, you know, over a thousand miles, which is what, 2000 kilometers or something like that, you know, in, yeah, in each wow. move all over the place. And I've learned that every city that I've lived in has wonderful people and terrible people. And no matter where I go, there's always a mix sure. of them. And in the end, I also see that, you know, because I've met people from all kinds of different philosophies, you know, people that are, mm -hmm. you know, very liberal, very conservative, or, you know, very religious or very non or, you know, just so many different political ideas and, you know, mm -hmm. economic ideas and different, you know, going to different countries that are very, very different than where I grew up. And in the end, my perspective is that most of us just want to have a happy life with our family and, you know, 98% of the human race. That's all we want. And we're actually mm -hmm. more alike than we are different. I flew on yeah. Delta airlines a lot because they're based where I live and they have this little video that plays when you, when you go on Delta and like, we realize that when we travel, that we see our, we have more similarities and differences. And like, it's really true. It really mm -hmm. is. Like I've been to some really crazy places too. Not crazy as in crazy, but just like places that Americans don't normally travel to. Yeah. And if I look at the 47 countries that I've been to, the culture that I would say was, that was the friendliest people was Iran, you know? Uh -huh. And I think most Americans at least would be like, isn't that a scary place? And yeah. like, well, it's a politically different place, but the people were just so lovely and so welcoming. I never had more people come up to me on the street who had never met me before. And they're like, next time you come, don't stay in a hotel, come stay at my house and have tea with me and mm. speak with me. And they were just so excited to connect as people. And uh, you don't get that unless you take the risk and, and go and stretch yeah. yourself. How much of your trips were work related versus just your personal trips? Most of them have been personal trips. Um, okay. I did yeah. take some time after for me when I finished high school and you know before I went to university, um, I took two years and traveled. Um, and one of those years I went with a friend and we'd bought an around the world ticket and just traveled a, all the way around the world. And most of the countries I've been to was in that one year. And we would stop yeah. and do humanitarian wow. aid work and just try to get out of our American bubble. And like not many Americans travel because our country is so big and has so much diversity. Yeah. Most people are like, I can go see desert and jungles and, you know, mountains and everything and never leave, you know, and, and speak English everywhere and don't have to get a passport. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, I want to break that and go, what do I want in my life? On How do I separate from the life that I had as a child and now become an adult and step away. And so my friend and I went to obscure places, you know, Bangladesh and Myanmar and, you know, the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan and just like, and we would go to refugee camps and just go and volunteer and help in any way that we could. And that changed my world for sure. That was mm -hmm. more valuable to me than I think university was yeah, because it formed me as a human to be able to learn to speak up and to, to, to be aware of myself. And I'm still growing in those ways. I just love travel. I love travel yeah. from an art standpoint too, like seeing your image of the hike that you did with Patrick. It was Patrick, right? Um, yeah. 
and it's just such a beautiful place and like it doesn't look like that here so mm-hmm. until i go to new zealand or iceland or switzerland you know my artistic side just opens up and i go wow i want to paint that yeah i think a lot of people think that traveling is expensive or has to be expensive but i think that's just an excuse yeah, it, <laughs> it does not have to be expensive <laughs> You can get around now this was couch surfing and... this was a long time ago when i did my around the world trip it was in mm. 1994 but i did the entire year with all of the flights all of the travel all of the food all of the hotels for twelve thousand mm-hmm. dollars which would be considered below poverty level if you were just staying at home in the u.s mm-hmm. so i did i did you know sleep on a lot of floors and youth hostels and you know but it was an amazing experience. Yeah. It doesn't have to be expensive. Yeah. I agree. So another question I had for you, what things outside of art inspire your art? I mean, travel is one of them, but are there other things that just, you know, get you inspired? Yeah. I guess music is still art, but that's a big one that moves me, especially the voice human voice yeah like there's this group called Hunhurtu from Tuva in the Mongolian oh really area oh yeah their throat singing super intense oh, amazing but wow um or or a laboratorium piesni a Polish group of singers women just like okay goes to the core you're going to have to send me some links after this because yeah. I'm always looking for new music and, you know, I, I have my list of very obscure, you know, groups as well. That would be great. Yeah. I li- like, I think this is also a consequence of traveling. Like you, your horizon broadens in all aspects. You start picking up a little bit more of different languages. You're not just listening to rock or hip hop. I listen to every genre. I don't care. Like it just has yeah. to be interesting. Yeah. Like, I want more variety, more breadth. And when painting or drawing, I have certain music that pushes me in different ways. Like sometimes it's really driving loud music and sometimes it's really calm and it has a different mood to it. And so, you know, I think it's very interesting seeing what happened to music from the internet because like, people ask what style do you like to listen to? I'm like, I don't know how to classify it because it's, it's Mm -hmm. so many different pieces that have all merged together. And like, there is an electronic folk international rock hip hop thing. And it's all one (laughs) now Mm. just changes everything. Okay. So, uh, one other question for you. Um, we had talked a little bit about, making things better than reality. So yeah. that process of, of learning, uh, I think one of the things between your career and mine, uh, I've worked mostly in the realm of imaginative art. Um, I work for animation studios and visual effects studios. And so we're always trying to make something that is not reality. But when doing studies, it is reality. And like really understanding what light does, you know, from a science and from a optical and a mind standpoint, and like understanding what a camera does versus what our eye does and what our brain does with that information. Yeah. How do you see that transition of making something better than reality? Um, what are your thoughts on how to translate between those two worlds? Like when you're teaching art and just just look at this and then draw you know fairies that are stealing the uh the the charcoal in the school Mm -hmm. how do you make the transition between those two things practice try (laughs) i think the more you you understand about how light works the more the more you'll see but also the more freedom you have to use all these different elements i teach 12 modeling factors i call them like light Mm -hmm. effects of what light does so many people have heard some of them but probably a lot of people have not heard all of these terms and some of them are incredibly powerful to create the illusion of form or space like ambient occlusion for example if you don't know about ambient occlusion you're not going to draw it it's not going to happen yeah if you don't if you don't know about it then you don't even see it 
yeah. when it's happening. Yeah. yeah. And you draw something and it's okay, but it's not quite like real. And then you add ambient occlusion shadows and boom, it comes alive. So understanding, I think, is a big part of, of that freedom, making things better than, than reality or more alive. I've been teaching some of the ideas and I'm putting this into my classes as well, but I call it the art of extraction. And yeah, it's being able that. to, it's, it's not just copying what you see, but getting the essence of it so that you can be like, I want to take that and make it into something, a whole different composition, but with the essence of the way that light works here and this bounce light and this specular highlight and this level of occlusion, but on this object. So I just was doing, I did a 3D scan of this little guy um, and it's a little caricature and like, you know, recreating this and like, what if this was made out of gold or what if this was made out of, mm -hmm. you know, something else? I think it's really, it's really fun. And you only have the experience of creating and studying is the way that you can have those like tools that you put into your brain. The more you've done paintings of real things, the more that you're yeah. like, oh, I, I, I understand what the light would do on that type of surface and with that type of light. Yeah, definitely studying nature. Like that's how you learn to see. I want to yeah. share something with you. We sure. don't have to like go all the way in, but I want to yeah. make you aware of it. And then we can talk about it in the future. Maybe it's Great. pretty nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a morphological analysis for oh, interesting. composition and, and image making there. Can you see? Yep. So morphological analysis is a, a way to simplify a complex system. It was used or invented by a physicist, a Swiss physicist, an astronomer called Fritz Zwicky. And I think to solve hard problems, it's used in politics and in engineering. And I thought this is cool, like a way of yeah, simplifying hard problems. The way it works is you list all the possibilities. So a medium for painting could be oil or pastel or pencil or charcoal or digital or aquarelle or more things. I, I haven't exhausted the list. Gouache, yeah, acrylic, yeah. whatever. There, we just expanded the model. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. Grounds, like paper, canvas, wood, dye bond, organic materials, priming. Anyway, you get the point, right? So right. when you make a project, you can say, what medium do I want? Okay, I'm gonna use oil. Then what ground? Oil and, let's call oil and wood. Okay, priming, rabbit skin glue. What scale? Tiny, large, let's make it huge. What shape of the, of the image? Because we don't have to have square paintings all the time. Right. It can be circle. And then, and there's like all these variables right to pull from i have conceptual structure how many focal points if there's a focal point hierarchy what compositional grid keys for hue value chroma shape language and then scene parameters i called it here like what location type is it uh, was there an element that's dominating the composition, like water or air, weather? So it's like a, a menu you can pick from. That's amazing. Yeah. So if you if you ever get stuck and like, what do I want to paint? Mm -hmm. You could almost like, it's like rolling the dice, you know, and yeah. <laughs> you, you could help make it easier to go, all right, I want an environment that is in a triangle composition using this medium. That's really cool. I, I like yeah. this. See, this is why it's good to have conversations with other artists, you know, stretch your world. I've not heard of that technique. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Love it. Very, very cool. All right. Let's see. Are there any other um, topics? I mean, for me, I would love to to do more, you know, of, of that idea and playing that into to my own art. Now, I've been trying to come up with in my class too, uh, you know, I'm, I'm teaching technical skills in the craft, but at the end of each lesson, I want to have a little bit of creativity 
as well. Something to spark imaginative drawing where you don't use reference and it's 100% out of your own head yeah. to just stretch that side a little bit every time. And, you know, I'm trying to do that in my own life as well to be like, I, you know, as much as I'm doing this study and I'm doing this thing, I want to expand out to, to be really, you know, imaginative and come up with a list of like, okay, I want to see um, a, a squid that lives in the desert you know, uh, what would that look like? How would it have evolved, you know, just come up with any type of idea and stretch myself in my imagination. Which I guess will make many listeners think about artificial intelligence tools to generate images, because you can just type in squid in the desert and it will get you four images back. So what, how do you see that? Pros Um, Pros and cons of AI art. Yeah. Yeah. This one is a hard one. Uh, You know, I made a video at the beginning of the year about my thoughts on AI art, and I Mm -hmm. actually took it off of YouTube Mm -hmm. because I keep learning more and the the topic is so complex. Yeah. And I, I, I don't really know exactly what I think about it. All I know is that I don't want to be an anxious person. I can, I can see a lot of doom and gloom and like, this is the end of arts and like, no, not for me. I'm going to paint. If it changes my industry, it's going to change our industry sure. for sure. Yeah. You know, but I want to adapt with it. Just like when I was a kid, all animation was two dimensional. It was all hand done. And then yeah. when 3d animation came, it, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs and some people adapted and got into the digital realm and like what is that going to be now if ai is changing things and there is it's very easy to have fear but i don't want to live in fear i want to live courageously so i'm not going to let the you know like i try to avoid the news in a lot of ways because i can't change what's happening on the other side of a planet you know i, I can't pull people out of you know a, earthquake rubble or stop a war or you know i don't have any power there but what i do have power over is the people in my life and the art that i do and how i spend my time and how do i find my calm and so i want to focus in on you know my craft and as much as i can to learn and to to work with whatever happens with ai it's definitely going to change the world i do think that there should be a lot of discussion about um what is legal and what is not I don't like the idea of someone coming and stealing a piece of my artwork and using it as theirs and then calling it their own, even though they only typed a sentence, but it stole a piece of my artwork. There was no effort that was put into them creating something new. Yeah. Like if somebody studies my artwork and wants to get the style of it and they take the time to hand paint themselves their own new piece, I'm happy with it. But if they're going to just take my piece and steal it and call it their own, then I'm not happy with it. And like AI is right in between i don't know yeah what are your thoughts well i found when i i mean i'm blown away it's it's rare that i'm really like impressed or like my mind is blown because i've seen a lot of things yeah but when i tried mid journey for the first time i was like okay this is a definitely a shift that's happening now and i created images and it's incredible uh at composing the really good compositions often you get a lot of noise also not interesting or or yeah good images but some images and if you find your prompts it's just amazing and i felt i realized that after spending two hours i have maybe 50 images or 80 images out of those five are like wow there's really something there what am i going to do with that right. and if i think of these five images, if my hard drive crashes now and I lose these images, meh, okay. But if someone burns my oil paintings, that would really hurt. So I think right. the effort, there's a, definitely a, a connection of how much effort we put into some, making something and how valuable it is to us and maybe also other people. And I can see it going in either direction that over the next 10 years, handmade things become less and less valuable because the focus is just on digital and nft and you know all ethereal things or the opposite that handcrafted things become more and more valuable right yeah and interesting also more and more interesting for people to do because we realize it's not making us happy to spend 10 hours a day 
looking into our smartphone on social media. It's a bad idea. It's very true. I feel very much that the industrial revolution changed the world in the 1800s and that we are living through another change. Like I'm, I'm a bit older than you. So I was raised without a computer at all, all Mm -hmm. the way through school in my house. And there was no internet, there was no cell phones, you know, and, and then I've lived through that transition of seeing how it's changing in the world. And social media is a beautiful thing and a terrible thing all at once. Yes, you know, which it, is also has, something you will learn right. traveling. Like you said, there are good people and bad people everywhere. It's, it's the, yep. the yin yang. There's always both sides. Always something to learn, always something there to to react to and to, to grow with. <clears throat> and so you just have to take it one day at a time and and see where things go. One thing that I am a little bit of afraid is that people will lose a love of the craft. Like I look yeah. back at, you know, you were talking about there's very few people that teach the traditional painting methods anymore. And I can see in society that there's not a lot of people that have the time to spend to really have that skill of observation, like really detailed observation. And AI is going to make that even worse because why would I spend time doing art at all if I can just type a sentence and the computer will do it for me? And so I think that culturally, if we had a whole generation of people who just type sentences for their art, I think we're going to lose something not only from the craft, but also in our storytelling that we just won't be as creative. The amount of time that it takes to tell your story, the harder that you've put the work into it, the more heart comes out of it. And so it, it'll be an interesting thing. I think what we're going to end up with is millions of images that are just <laughs> meh, you know, they don't have yes. a story. They're just going to be, yeah. they're going to be pretty, but they won't, they won't have a message that has any meaning, any human meaning to them. You yeah. know, seeing your friend Patrick's work, there's meaning in every brushstroke of what he's doing and what he's crafting. And if yeah. AI were to do the same thing, it would just be a random collage of stuff. Yeah, that could still be amazing and you could still see, find meaning in it but you as the artist will feel very differently about it after you made right. it. Yes. Speaking of crafts, I have a few, I had an amazing experience in Japan where I met a, a ceramicist. Oh yeah. Who invited me then after meeting to spend two days with him. And this guy lives in a forest like overlooking a bay. And he goes out to the mountains and collects soil and rocks and minerals, brings them home to the studio and makes his own clay from scratch. Really? Wow. And then he uses wood from the forest to, to heat the studio. The ashes from that wood become the glaze for his pieces. Wow. And like he finds iron and adds some iron to the glazes. Like incredible. That That's glaze. amazing. I would love to show a few pictures. Yes. I think sharing those experiences also gives people, if you, whoever is watching, feel like, wow, okay, there's something in that that resonates with me. You know that you need to do things with your hands because it makes you happy. <laughs> gives you yeah. your life meaning. So I was walking up there and this is the assistant, uh, Nagata. And was working with him for for two days, like chopping wood and making clay. Wow, that's amazing. And Kentaro is the, the ceramics master. So here we're mixing clay and then pouring it in here and then hanging it in hammocks so the water drips out. And uh, these are some of the Kentaro's work. Wow. A wheel it's a kicking wheel he has a, a manual kicking wheel and also two electric ones the ash from <laughs> the stove he built his studio as well like designed and built the studio and he built his kiln a climbing kiln that they fire four times a year and it needs to be kept going for three days i think two or three days so 24 hours, someone has to 
feed wood All to the keep time. the temperature up. That's amazing. That's the kiln. See, I that perspective. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. The perspective <laughs> of other cultures. Yeah. Just being able to like see that that somebody does that they spend their days doing that that's so inspiring he made all all these pieces and he wants them to be used so he uses them himself too that's, oh, that's him amazing that's him there that's assistant and that's a friend at night after dinner having some sashimi <laughs> <laughs> And then I slept in the gallery space. They put a bed on the tatami mat for me in the gallery. So I woke up surrounded by all the, by the art, all the pieces. And I spent that night uh, watching videos on how to throw uh, on a wheel. Because <laughs> I knew tomorrow maybe I can try myself and I wanted as much oops, sorry, uh, practice as I could. This was in the morning after waking up. Just the space, I mean, everything is so designed with so much care. This is the studio where the work is made. <sighs> it was amazing. I remember traveling to um, to Scotland and I was on the Isle of Skye and mm. there was this place that I had seen advertised that handmade swords. And, you know, I, I love sci-fi and things like that. So like, oh, I want to stop and see this. And there was three artisans who lived in this 400-year-old stone, you know, building under the giant mountains. And it was just such an inspiring landscape. And then they would hand make, you know, one of them was like a silversmith. One of them was a jewel, you know, cutter. And then one was a blacksmith. And they came up with a way, you know, being in Japan, they you know, folded steel katanas. and these they had studied the way that folded steel works but instead of folding it they would braid it and so in the end wow. the blades <laughs> had this braided texture into the metal itself that made it strong but it made it so beautiful of course they were way too expensive it was like ten thousand pounds for a single sword so i'm like yeah. i will just appreciate that you get <laughs> to make this and i'll take a picture and <laughs> it's so amazing but i often have thought in my career when I'm doing long hours and working on games or working on movies that sometimes mm -hmm. that slowing down of just being able to go and make a craft and to refine it to that top level and take the time to really invest in it. That's always been attractive to me and a simpler yeah. lifestyle, um, yeah. which not, not a lot of people can do to just go and make pottery and go explore the forest to find your materials. And that's just amazing. Again, where yeah. travel, travel changes you as a person and as an artist. Yeah. And also meeting people in person. Like I thought about the questions that you sent and then under one of those questions, one piece of advice that came to mind was to encourage people to meet other people. Maybe about how to how to get inspired if you're like losing motivation. For me, like meeting Kentaro in, in Japan is like big boost. Meeting you also virtually but still like they left me yeah. so energized our first conversation so if if you watching feel a little bit down and like Ugh, i'm not sure and i know i should draw or hmm, go meet people who are like-minded ideally in person i think at a conference yeah. or start a meetup or something but meeting other people um i thought for a long time that i have to do everything myself to be a real artist, I have to come up with the idea myself. I have to make the composition. I have to paint it. I have to take the pictures. I have to build my own website. You know, <laughs> I learned a lot. I like that complexity, but 
I think if uh, if we embrace working with other people, especially when we're stuck. Yeah. Like now, when I'm stuck with a composition, I don't suffer in the stuckness, feeling like I have to do it myself. I call a friend. I ask Patrick to come over, and we solve it together. And it's fun to <laughs> to work on it together. And then the block is dissolved, and I can move on. And you learn something because their yeah. perspective, their history is so different that they'll bring something that you'd be like, oh, I didn't think of that. Just I just yeah. don't have the experience to think of that. That's really great. Yeah. I know in our last call, we talked to and, and an idea that I've had brewing in my mind that I think would be very fun, you know, someday be able to to go to Switzerland or somewhere in the world and get a group of artists that are really passionate and to do a photographic painting trip you know, where it's all yes. about the art and connecting together and eating together and just like having these type of conversations, but in person over a week or something like that. And yeah. just seeing what we explore. Uh, I've always wanted to do that. I think that would be fun. So we'll have to yeah. make sure that that happens at some point. I'm planning something like that. Yes. And maybe if those watching, put in the comments if you're interested in that so, so we can gauge the interest. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That'd be very fun. All right. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. We're coming to the end here. Nice long talk. I might edit some of this, some parts out, but I'll try to keep as much of it in as I can. So just any of the lags so that it's not too long of a video, but um, sure. I really appreciate you taking the time. This is a lot of fun. And uh, again, I, I feel motivated. I want to go, go create and I want to travel and, uh, you know, learn more. Uh, thank Same you here. Again. Yeah. I would love to do more stuff together, you know? Yeah. Whatever. We should try a so collaboration. Yeah, yeah, definitely some collaborations. One of the things, I don't know if you saw in the past week, I took, I put a poll out to just say, would somebody be interested in seeing their own work recolored, you know, just like a way of thinking. Uh -huh. And so I did that with, I picked, you know, and I got uh, 150 different pieces of artwork, you know, of people that sent in different things. And I, I just chose one of them it would be very fun to do this, like swap each other's artwork, you know, something imaginative that you've made. And then, you know, like we we'll just change it, you know, you add your style to mine. I'll add my style to yours and just see what yeah. we would learn from each other. I think that would be a lot of fun. That sounds great. I also love doing like clinics or paint overs. People, yeah. I mean, that's what I do every week with the homework assignments. If I get an image and I see, because of the experience I have, I can see pretty quickly what needs to change and then making that change. And then the thing pops yep. and having the visual experience of why things work and how they work. I think it's really fun. I would love to do stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. One other thought quick before we close too, I've realized too, that I learn from everyone and it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what level of experience you have. Sometimes Absolutely. the best idea has come from somebody who has been in the industry for two weeks and the people who've been in it for 40 years didn't see that. And so like learning from one another, it's just like from cultures and to go, I never think that I'm a director, so I should make all the choices and this intern can't speak and like, oh no, everybody can learn from everywhere. Yeah. And so that's one of those fun things of being okay with showing your artwork and getting feedback from anyone. Yeah. Uh, can always learn something new. This is the attitude that um, Andrew Loomis, to me, has in his books. Like, hey, let's do this together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, Dorian, thank you again for your time. And thank you. we will have to meet again soon to uh, just chat and encourage one another. Yeah. Um, and for all the viewers, thank you again for, for being patient and watching this. Uh, hopefully there's good information here. All right. Thank you all again for watching. I hope that that was insightful. Until next time, keep creating. Bye.